All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Jan Erickson from Stepping Aside, and welcome to Somewhat Daily Tarot and Rune for the 18th day of September 2018. We have a nine day today in this year of illumination. 18 reduces to nine. You add that to nine for September, you get 18 again, and then again reduces to nine. It's one of the phenomenons of the multiples of three that seems to happen in numerology. Nine is about completion. Uh, 2018 reduces to 11. We'll leave that there uh, as a master number for illumination. So something may be coming to completion today for you. We'll see what the cards have to say, though. Let's count 13 and see what we have. Well, we have the nine of wands. For those of you who haven't been here before, if this is your first time, welcome. Uh, what I do is I usually pull one card in one rune, although sometimes I do two cards in two runes. I did two runes the other day just to get more information. If I pull a car card, I'm going to pull another card because we need to know a little more about it. And sometimes, you know, just pulling one card, you can get an idea of its meaning, but Maybe you don't know what precipitated it or what, you know, what energies are surrounding it or situations are surrounding it. So it's always nice to pull another one. But here we have a synchronicity with the day being a nine day. This is the nine of wands. And here we see a man. He's come through some battle. You see the bandage on his head. He's holding his, his, his wand or his staff. Wands are, 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 are usually portrayed in the Rider weight deck as staffs. So I don't know. It's a it's a uh, representing the fire element. So our will, catalytic energy, purpose, creativity. But here we have he's looking kind of uh, kind of back at the situation that he just came out of. Maybe he's thinking about about the battle he just endured. Maybe it was a battle of wills. Now you can look at the that the at the the staff standing up in back of him as. Uh, they kind of look like they're in some semblance of a balance. You see two and two and one, and then maybe looks like he's taken the one that might match with uh, this one right here. That might be this one here that he's holding, but then the rest all seem to be in alignment over here. Over here, so you might you might view that as still the threat looming, or you might view that as as support. You know, that that this is the the final outcome, that in truth, you really have more support than you know. Sometimes, you know, in a battle of wills or when we're trying to to effect something or, or manifest some, something, uh, we want something to come into play. We want something come into, to come into being. And maybe we're having to struggle with that. Maybe we're not getting what we want. Um, sometimes it feels like, you know, the world is against us. And, you know, with him looking, let me get my magnifying glass with him looking, uh, he's kind of looking back at them in a way. You can see his eyes. I know it's difficult. It would be difficult for you guys to see this, but maybe you can. But if you see, you see his eyes are kind of looking, you know, furtively. It's like a furtive glance, you know, like, like is, is it really over? Like maybe he's not quite sure that it's actually really over, whatever this battle of wills was. But either it's still there but see, with it being the nine, it's doubtful, isn't it? Because of the sense of completion, then you wouldn't you wouldn't see this as a threat. But maybe he's just looking to see that, and maybe he's not actually looking back at them because he could just simply be looking toward the past, uh, and 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 just sort of reliving all of the all of what's transpired. And that's really what I think it is. So maybe you've come through some stuff recently. Maybe, and maybe this card is telling you that that. Maybe it's over. Maybe you can just let it go now. And and the battle of wills is over. And uh, it's just time to move on and and heal. You know, clearly, he's not in the best of condition with the bandage on his head. He's got a head wound. So he's not, you know, he needs to take some time now and, and just heal from the whole experience. But let's draw one more card here. Make sure I don't drop any. Uh, let's draw one more card and see if, if we can get just a little more information about this whole battle of wills. And it, 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 who knows? We might be able to see something here. Let 
Well, we've got the chariot, which is a seven. It's the seventh card of the major arcana. Sevens can mean uh, uh, it can mean divinity. It can mean uh, a type of balance. I look at it as a seven as a balance and um, a card of ba or, or a number of balance because I, I look at it as like the scales. If you were to depict it in a, you know drawing it out. You could theoretically have three and three and one, which means you've kind of got scales. And so you have an interesting point of balance. And in a, in a very real sense, when you look at the chariot, that's what we have here. We have we have the black and white sphinx in front um, We that's pulling the, the, the chariot with the king inside. Um, it's, it's knowing when to to take control and knowing when to let go also. And, and he's basically just allowing, he's standing up there observing what's going on around him as he's either, you know, it looks like these, these, uh, uh, that, that his, his steeds or his, his, uh, his sphinxes, but whatever it is that's pulling the chariot along, uh, some of them, sometimes it's horses and, uh, uh, in, it depends on the deck though. Um, but basically you're looking at things in balance, aren't you? It's about the duality of an experience, the polarity of an experience. But it's an interesting type of balance, isn't it? And so I think that rather than seeing where this where he came from, I don't think that the chariot is telling us where he came from. I think that the chariot is telling us where he needs to go. That now that, that the, the battle of wills is over, that it's time now to, to, to move forward uh, and, and, and to take whatever mastery and, and wisdom you've gained from that experience and, and, and use that in, in terms of, of where you're going in the future. But, and to know that, that with all of this support behind you, you're, you're a whole lot better prepared. You're in a better spot than you know, in other words. Uh, and it's okay at this point to let others take the reins. And, and to just sit there and, and, and be in your glory, you know, of who you are and as source energy and just experience life, you know, while someone else is driving the cart, basically. It's okay to do that. You know, uh, one of the things that reminds me of, if you've ever listened to Eckhart Tolle, he's, he's delightful, isn't he? If you've listened to him. And it's really about allowing. I could tell, you know, when I first heard him that that he had some background in A Course in Miracles. Some of us who've read that text and done the workbook, it's a little hard to let go of those ideas. Uh, I think that it was originally channeled to help Christians understand Christianity. At least that's what it, it that's that's what the story was, I think. But uh, I, because along the way, you know, the, the message gets a little bit confused, maybe. And so at least according to this channel text, that's the case. And uh, a lot of the channel texts out there go, they scratch their head and go, oh no, that's not what that means. And so, so you learn uh, different things about atonement and forgiveness and, and, and you learn that ultimately forgiveness, even though you have to do it, it's actually judgment because you're forgiving them for do someone for doing something that actually they never actually did. But it was only your perception. I mean, they could have done something, but but your perception is what gives it its its real worth, right? And so you judge it as bad or good. You're deciding what the worth of that experience is, and so that's really where all that's coming from. But but what Eckhart Tolle does is he'll. One time there was a video. My my husband was watching it, and he's just laughing. I'm like, what are you watching? And it was Eckhart Tolle sitting. Up, he, he he had this this deal, this is event, right? And he goes up on the stage, and he's sitting in the chair. And he's just sitting there, just sitting there looking at everybody, you know, and then he gives this little Eckhart Tolle laugh that he gives. And, and it's just like everybody got it. You know, it's like we don't have to do a thing. We can just sit and be together and experience one another. And it's enough, you know. Well, if we were to adopt that it's enough attitude to just be with one another and experience one another in joy and in unity and in love, well, you know, that's kind of the message of the of the chariot. And it's the message we're here saying, OK, it's enough. It's time to just let it go and, and recognize the strength that you have, the wisdom that you've gained, the support that you have. And move on in some. Uh, joy. And balance. 
but let's see what the rune has to say. But I like the idea of the chariot in terms of when to surrender and when to take control. We don't always have to control things. I, I, when you have someone in your life that, that um, is a strong personality, uh, I'm a strong personality, my husband is a strong personality. So sometimes it seems like each one of us is vying for control of the moment. Um, him probably more so than me. Uh, I tend to be more, um, can we just get to the point where we're on the same page? You know, in other words, let's let's talk about it and see if we can, you know, get at least on the same page. And so I'm more of the 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 chariot where I, i'm I'm more willing to sit in that middle position, you know, and try to bring balance to the situation so that at least we can move forward in truth, you know, um, but but it's a uh, it's a uh, when you have two powerful people with with he's with 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 powerful, uh, uh, resonances, then, then it's, it's an interesting, you know, the conversation can get pretty spirited. Um, one of the things that I, I'm really interested in is something called human design. Um, Ra Uruhu came up with this system. It, it, it employs aspects of astrology, you know, uh, but it really employs aspects of the I Ching. And, and it's, it's just the most amazing system. I love it. You know, in fact, I probably, love it more than astrology. Um, it's, uh, it, it's just an interesting way of looking. Uh, instead of an astrological chart, you, you get a body gram, you do a body gram. And uh, I actually have the software, the professional version of the software, and so I do those. And uh, uh, it's interesting to see how, how the concept of you start out as the design crystal, and then roughly 88 days uh, before you're born, the personality crystal comes in to play and uh, uh, you start to see the differences between your initial design and then the, and then the personality, because the personality factors, those, those, those things are going to be what you show to the world, but then whether, and then that brings into our whole ideas of, li, not, of making sure you don't live the not self, which we all do, you know, and to live your authority. My husband, the whole point of this and the whole thing of, of knowing when to, to allow and when to, when to take control um, I, I get around to what I'm talking about eventually. I really do. I promise, but I tend to ramble, but, uh, but the whole idea of it is that the, what, what Ra found out is that, is that, uh, we break down into five personality types and the majority of us are generator types. We're either going to be, uh, we're either going to have a right or left angle incarnation cross. If you're a right angle, then you're pretty much concerned with your own stuff here in this life. If you're a left angle, you're concerned, you, you stand on the edges and you're more concerned about the greater whole. I'm one of those. My husband's the right angle. My kids are right angles. And so, so even though the generators do the work of, of the, basically do the work of the world, the manifestors are the ones that are the leaders. And so they're the ones that will tell you what to do. And then the generators carry them out, carry out those, those, those instructions, basically. And I know that's kind of simplistic way to look at it, but it illustrates how you have someone who, as they're born, their, their, their definition is one where they're going to have more of a push energy and they're going to lead and they're going to want to control. And then when you have someone like me who also wants to do that, but that's also my not self, right? So if I do that, then sometimes it doesn't work out. That's the whole idea of being a generator. You're supposed to wait to respond, Whereas manifestors are supposed to in initiate. So if I'm initiating and my husband is waiting to respond, then the, then the conversation doesn't go as well. If he initiates and I respond, it seems to go better. So it's just an interesting way to look at the dynamics of interaction, you know, energetic interaction. But let's pull a rune and see what it has to say. But I recommend it. Go over to jovianarchive.com and that's, that's the main site for 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 uh, human design and, and just check it out. You can get, I think they still do a free body gram, you know, and, uh, uh, and you just got to give it, you just enter your, your birth date and all that, just like you would on an astrological chart. And you can kind of get an idea of, 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 of what all this is. And it's just another way of uh, getting some information about our lives. In addition to astrology and tarot and runes and geomancy and all those wonderful things that we can, we can use just tools just to help us along, you know, kind of give us a different perspective maybe we haven't considered before. 
But anyway, we I pulled on Seuss, which is communication. It's, uh, 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 it's the Odin's rune. It's the fourth rune, I believe, of the Elder Food Farm. Uh, yep. And uh, it's, 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 it's basically our higher self informing. Okay. We call it Odin's rune and we think of, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about the whole pantheon of the gods and who they were. Um, it's sort of, you know, we think of them as myth. We think of them as, as fantasy and as storylines. Well, I don't think so. I think they were here. I don't buy that we just sort of became humans on our own. I think that many, many, many eons ago, we had, you know, people here on this planet that weren't from here and they needed a workforce. And so they created one out of whatever was here at the time. Um, I think we've had various kinds of intervention that way genetically along, along the, the course of humanity's existence. And so whatever we are today, we owe to those people that were here and doing all of that for better or for worse. So some of those people, when we talk about the Norse gods and that's what Odin is from, these were just people that were here and they were far more advanced. And so the lesser advanced people viewed them as gods. And I'm sure that those people took full advantage of whatever, you know, advancements they had over the rest of us. And so Odin was somebody that was here and uh, the Norns of fate gave him the runes and, uh, you know, we have this wonderful, rich uh, language because that's what runes are. They aren't just a divination tool. They're a language. Um, you also see there's also oem. You can see that they're, they're little lines with little, well, anyway, it's another type of an alphabet. The oem fuse or the oems, o, oem staves. It's, it's pronounced O-G-A or it's spelled O-G-H-A-M. This pronounced oem. And uh, uh, they're fun to work with too. I've worked with those as well. Um, but, but what they what he did is he gave people a set of principles to live by and to consider uh, energetic influences to consider and that's what the elder futhark is from there there's other other sets of runes there's witches runes there's the younger futhark there's the icelandic futhark there's various ones you know um, but there had to be a way to communicate and uh, and also a way to you know divine the future and divine what was going to happen to them um, these were nomadic people, the Druids were, and uh, uh, they moved about and they got involved in all kinds of things. Um, so you had the priest caste, which was, you know, Bran the Blessed and all of that. You know, he's, a, he's an ancestor of mine. Uh, you had all these people that, that uh, used the runes in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, you had the Norse Volvas, you had the, the, the Seaths or the Saiths. Uh, Saith magic, S E I D H R, I think it's spelled. Um, basically, these were people that that uh, uh, gave wisdom to the community and to their tribe, and a lot of the times they use runes to do it. So, um, symbology has been around forever, and this is just another one of them. Uh, but but as far as Odin's rune going, uh, basically what it's telling us is that is that. And this is something that we could also align with the chariot, because if you look at this in terms of directionality, if you look at this in terms of as above, so below, you could conceivably think of the guy in the chariot as spirit. And then these two down here as the polarity of form. You could also look at it that way. And with Odin's rune coming up, with Ansu's coming up, we're, we're basically saying, we're talking about a message. It could be a message. Well, the message is the war is over. Let it go. The battle of wills is over. We have more than we know. It also invokes divinity within. Uh, it brings clarity and intelligence to the situation. And it allows ourselves to channel our higher self. So I've been talking a lot about the idea of allowing spirit to inform our process. So if you were to look at the chariot in that regard, then you could look at this, you could look at him as spirit informing this process. But what is he doing? He's, he's taking his hands off the reins, hasn't he? <clears throat> and he's just letting spirit 
drive the moment. Letting spirit interact with these guys down below, and they're just sitting there. Everyone's just sitting in observation, aren't they? Well, that's what spirit does. Spirit observes. It's the ego that reacts. So if the spirit is going to inform the ego to react properly, if we allow that, then things work out a whole lot better. In human design terms, it would mean we're living our authority and, and we're not, you know, trying to live our not self. Be, in other words, be, I don't know why he came up with that. He calls it the not self. In other words, you're not living according to your true purpose and to your true meaning. But uh, uh, it was just a, a, a little bit of a slogan or, or just a way of describing it. He calls it living in the not self. But uh, he actually passed away some time ago. But uh, he, brought, he brought such a wonderful system of human design. So I really recommend you go over to Jovian Archive. I have some stuff on my blog about it. Um, sometimes I do blog posts on it. And uh, it, it's just a, a neat thing to look at. Um, but every time I see the chariot, I think about that. Okay, self, not self, living your authority, not living your authority. How much hell are you going to cause yourself today? You know, and that's really what we have to always remember. You know, a lot of the times the hell that we experience is one that from our own making. It's from, it's from our thoughts processes. It's not from necessarily anything that's happening around us. You know, bad things can happen around us, but we can choose how we respond. And we always forget that. We think, oh, well, you made me feel this way. Well, no, you chose your feelings. I mean, it's not to say that the other person didn't do something awful, you know, that anyone would feel bad about. But see, we, it's just that we get caught up in the anyone would feel bad about it part of it. And that's where we go off the deep end, right? And we start blaming everybody else for the feelings that we have. You know, I might not like everything someone does, but that doesn't mean that I have to then, you know, become a mess over it either. Uh, but, you know, it happens. You know, we do it. We're human. We we. We get mixed up. We, we don't let spirit inform the process. We forget that that's what we are. And uh, uh, I don't know. You know, it's just part of the trials and tribulations of life that we that we bring about either collectively or individually. Because that's the other part of it. You know, we're, we're part of this collective unified presence. You know, we may appear as individuals, but in fact, we're we're one in source energy. Uh, we're one as the creator. So. It sort of changes things, though, doesn't it? When you think about it that way, when you look at everyone else and they're your other self, you know, they're the other side of self. Because if it's a creator expressing itself into form and that's what all this is, isn't that what's going on? So we might be nice people on our, uh, you know, we might express ourselves as nice people, but maybe someone else doesn't. But we're just exploring when and how we see that what we're watching, what we're witnessing is just another aspect of self. You know, it's that whole expression there, but for the grace of God, go I. Well, yeah, you know, any one of us could have chosen a different path. You know, we could have chosen a more difficult path. We could have chosen one that, that, that uh, uh, is, is problematic and oppressive on other people. And, you know, maybe you're not an honest person. Maybe you, but, but you have to realize, you know, a lot of that was chosen. That theme, that, fo that focus, that purpose was chosen. Now, it doesn't mean you can't, you know, awaken from it and move in a better direction. But all too often, that's not what happens. Instead, people just seem, you know, all too often, they just want to explore that, that negative side, you know, or that service to self side that the, that the uh, Law of One talks about. So, you know... And that's another text that's excellent to read. Go to, uh, I think it's called Law of One Inf dot info or something. And you can just go and you can read the whole thing there if you want to. Uh, or you can download it. Um, I recommend it. It's a five-volume series. It's a ch another channel text. Uh, but it gives us a lot of interesting information about our past, about how we got here and, and what all of that was. And, and you really do find that it's about living in the sevens in a way, you know, where you're sitting here in observation and you're trying to keep everything in balance in letting spirit in that middle position inform that process, that process of duality and, and polarity that we're finding ourselves in. So, um, or that we're trying to ascend out of, you know, um, so cool. You know, the will is, 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 you know, we've, we're done with the battle. The war is won and now it's time to <clears throat> allow and let spirit inform. Awesome.
Well, thanks so much for stopping by. Go check out the blog at Stepping Aside at imsteppingaside.com. I think I'm going to do another tarot reading today. I'm going to put up on it. Um, and uh, yeah, so I guess that's it. I was going to I was going to say something else, but then it went away. You know, I'm old. What do you do? It just vanishes before your very eyes. It's like you try to catch it you know, before it goes away, but it's too late. Anyhow, you guys have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow. Blessed be.